I got nothing against the author or artist, okay? So just because Immelman from Concession is connected to this one, it's not bashing on him, nor the author of this comic. Also, I do not take pleasure in trash-talking furries. I sincerely don't. I honestly think that the idea of furries is an interesting concept that can be used for more than I've experienced it being used for. Like, sentient animals. With so many types and races of animals, how would the world look if it was controlled by them? I mean, look at our world and how it's been shaped because of racism. Imagine it being with animals. I'm serious here. Feel free to take from this idea as much as you want. It'd be a very fascinating world to not only see if there was any typical behavior for certain animals, but also architecture. And if you were going for a more comedic approach, a lot of jokes that could be focusing on the typical behavior of certain animals. Like dogs needs to pee standing up, or something with ostriches sticking their head into the ground when they're scared. And even if you're not going to that extent with making a story, but rather have it being in a real world with furries instead of humans, that's okay too! And I know there's tons of good comics out there with furries, but for every good comic there has got to be at least 10 bad ones. And that's merely focused on some kind of animal fetish. And then there's shit like this comic, that just doesn't work because it's furries. And it's fucking horrible. So get ready ladies and gentlemen, this is going to get long and loud. This is Furtier High. This comic tries too hard. The comic has two levels, none or extreme. This ruins it because, well, it's a lot like a joke that falls flat and the guy who made the joke tries to explain why the joke was funny. It just becomes even more unfunny. It's also, what? The hell? Oh, trust me, this gets annoying. Really fucking annoying. Every time you load a new page and go down to read, BAM! It throws you back up to the top only to see this. And you have to scroll like a madman to get down to the comic again. I mean, how much do you have to fuck up to make it so even the web page makes the comic unenjoyable to read? And I'm not judging this pile of furry shit prematurely. I read the entire thing and trust me, it doesn't get much better. The comic isn't the worst I've ever read, but man this comic fucks up everything. The best is the art, and as you might be able to see, that's only mediocre. The thing that wins this comic some points is that while it being a furry comic, there's no real sex in it, so hey, nicely refreshing. When I say that the comic tries too hard, I'm probably never gonna hear the end of fans of this comic saying that that is simply due to the comic's bold move to juggle drama and comedy. But we'll get back to that. I covered this in my Cyanide and Happiness review, but a joke is made up as a setup and a punchline. Imagine it as the art of a long jump. The setup is the running start, while the jump is the actual joke. Typically, the better the setup, the better the jump. If there's no running start, chances are you'll fall face first into the ground. Like the majority of this comic's jokes. Most of the time the pages build up like uh, drama drama drama, and then suddenly Quetstrake remembers, oh right we need some humor, and then he shoehorns it in there. See? When you make a half-assed attempt on comedy that's shoehorned in, it's not funny. It doesn't ever make you want to punch someone. It's the same kind of half-assedness that drives the plot. First of all, let's not even pretend that none of this isn't copy-pasted from Bleach. 
Go on. Defend it. Say that I'm wrong. Are you done? Because then allow me to show you this. First of all, let's overlook the fact that everything is grey toned in here, which is similar to Ichigo's mental world. But the thing hammering the nail in the coffin is this sentence. A speech about horse and kings. Funny. That's the whole thing that Hello Ichigo talks to Ichigo about. I re fucking fuse to believe that this is a coincidence. And I'm probably gonna get some wise ass telling me this is just a parody or something, but fuck that. I believe it if Kale's mental world didn't bear so many similarities. The comic's premise can also just go and fuck right off. Yeah, it doesn't focus on porn, big step in the right direction. But then it's just one step forward and a backwards somersault back. The comic focuses around Kale being the last human on Earth and is attending school. It is later pointed out that all the humans turn into furries through evolution. The idea is well enough thought out, but let me voice my issue with this premise with a question. If you had, somehow, come into possession of the last living dinosaur, would you hurl its ass into a kennel? No. Why not? Oh, that's right, CAUSE IT'S THE LAST FUCKING KIND OF ITS SPECIES! The kids gotta learn and interact with people. I get that. But this is just too retarded. People would have this guy in a lab, study and be on a constant guard and under a microscope. So when Kale gets in a fight with the school bully, I was ready to hurl my computer screen out of the window in frustration. There is a small fee for killing or just harming the last of a thing's race. I still believe some Norwegian people are headhunting the Danish retard who shot the last special white deer they had. The premise revolves around Kale and his life in the world of furries, but at the same time it tries to have a lot of subplots going as well. It's been a while since we had one of these. Riser's offer tip number 8. Making a plot is like raising a kid. Don't leave it unattended. Fatia High tries to have a lot of things going for it. The main plot is some story about how Kale supposedly was forced into being a human when he was originally a fox. Then there's the subplots. Subplots are excellent ways to sort of break the flow of the main plot. That prevents it from getting boring. However, Quetzaldrake does a really typical beginner's mistake that you will surprisingly find in many modern works of fiction. He doesn't end the subplots. God fucking... Ending a subplot doesn't necessarily mean to solve an issue with a happy ending. I mean, look at Love Hina. There's no hiding that Kanako, Keitaro's stepsister, has feelings for Keitaro. But Ken Akamatsu manages to show us that she accepts that he has feelings for Naru. That is ending a subplot. Personally, I'd go for Mutsumi. That girl is dead! Fatia Hai has a ton of subplots, and I don't recall one being fully ended. Now again, I'll probably have some whiny know-it-all telling me that it can still be solved, seeing the comic isn't done yet. And while that may be true, it would also be better if they just abandoned the subplot altogether. Why? Well, how would you feel if you were reading this and was introduced to a subplot at page 10, and then it wasn't even spoken of until page 380? You'd be all, wait, the fuck is this all about all of a sudden? Oh well. You might actually be smart enough to figure it out, because, hey, you're watching this, it shows you're clever. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The things in this comic doesn't work for the sole reason that it's furries. Like, Kale should have noticed something was wrong WHEN HIS PARENTS WERE ANIMALS! Then there's of course also the whole thing with Kale being at school, and then there's something as small as a fucking hot dog vendor being a pig! That's like a man standing on the corner selling human intestines. Shit, even the fact that the animals eat meat is a huge fucking thing all of a sudden. All of a sudden, it's not just a piece of meat. Suddenly, it's probably someone's mom, dad, or child. I mean, just look at this shit. Oh, fuck this shit. A huge problem I have with this comic and its way of telling a story is its absurd way of telling said story. It seems to think that it's okay to simply change shit on the fly. 
Like at one point we see Kale kiss his girlfriend and pass out or something. But later we are told he got hit by a car. And to make matters worse, we never get to see this. How the fuck does this begin to make sense? You can't do that. This shit wasn't even in Sonic 2. Now look what you made me do. You made me say you're almost worse at telling a story than Christian Weston Chandler. I'm not proud. Neither should you be. One last thing I'd like to point out in the premise section is something a skunk called Hugo says. Furries are a mix of human and animal. Their minds contain elements of both. This has led them to becoming more instinctual, reactionary, simple. Honestly, thinking about it, this would be an excellent way to explain all the furry porn. I'm so not even joking. Now feed me with your hate mail. Your hate only makes me stronger. Mwaha! The art is okay, but I honestly feel that Quit Straight could do much more than this. Hands, feet, ankles, backgrounds, everything looks pretty good. Then how come the shading is so... mediocre? No, the shading isn't bad, but I just feel like it's, I don't know, half done. Like the upper half of a shirt will be well shaded, and then the bottom half is just one color. Credit where it's due, the art is okay, and I honestly believe that Quest Drake has potential to grow and go far. But he probably shouldn't make an action comic. His actions are less than spectacular, making most of the fights seem as fluid as a brick in a rain ditch. Riser's artist tip number three. When people do an action, it's rarely to never that they only move one part of the body. Typically, one can say the more extreme the move, the more the rest of the body moves as well. This is known as kinetic linking. Here is a thing with the art I don't get though. I know Furries is for the most part considered a fetish, but seeing this comic isn't exactly considered to be spank material, I gotta ask this. Why are there so few animal types? Like, why are there no birds? Why are there no fish? What about cows? How about insects? What? Oh, because they don't have fur? Well, that was really selective of evolution to only take the things with overgrowth of hair. But there's really not all that much to say about the art. It's good, and I gotta give Quet Drake credit for his balls to do some untraditional things, such as changing art style at certain points. There is, however, one thing. At one point, Quetstrake dresses up his character in a suit complete with vest, shirt and tie and claims that this is the costume of Godot from the Phoenix Wright series and that he simply left out the mask of Godot so he wouldn't get sued for copyright. OBJECTION! This does not make sense, seeing that one cannot own a particular set of clothes one would normally find in one's wardrobe. Not only that, but the defendant in question is not even wearing all of the stuff needed to fulfill Godot's costume, mainly the characteristic mask. <laughs> Lastly, you drew one of your other characters later wearing a cyan colored beanie with the words Papa written on it with bright pink letters. This same beanie can be found upon Phoenix Wright in the game Apollo Justice. Therefore, your honor, for being stupid, this situation is... Alright, it should be here somewhere. <sighs> Fuck you, comic. I've wanted to do this ever since I sat down writing this review, mostly because a lot of people don't seem to get the importance of great characters. Great characters can help the story, but also you as a writer. If you make a great enough characters, you don't need to worry about the story, because the characters will deal with the situations on their own, so to speak. All you really have to do as a writer is simply just go with the flow and they'll make the story for you. Rises offer tip number 9. When you let your characters shape the story, it's known as a character driven story. They are often considered more fluid, seeing you can almost be sure no one is acting out of character. On the other hand, if you have really bad characters, you're simply just making your own work much much harder. 
as is the case with this comic. Fuck me, these characters suck. And then again, some of them are okay. Kale, as a matter of fact, is rather well written. He has some sort of OCD and is reacting to certain situations like you'd think he'd do. But then again, that's only once every goddamn year. Next we got Ashley, who's a cat and rather tomboyish, but also has a feminine side to her. She can fuck right off. Quidstrak seems to have gotten the same ideas went by when characters such as Naru from Lavina or Sakura from Naruto was made. This one guy has a crush on her, and every time he confesses and does something nice to her, she slaps his shit up. Why? Why does she have to be a bitch? Is it supposed to be funny? Cause it's not. It just makes her seem heartless and an all around unlikable character. She doesn't really help anyone either, and the only thing she ever does for Kale is helping him getting the shit kicked out of him. With friends like these. Next up is Campy, a bunny. He goes through some major changes throughout the comic, and it makes me think that Questrike just made him and then went on to throw shit at the wall to see what stuck. At first, he's constantly sleeping, mumbling, and rarely ever talking, and then BAM, he doesn't shut the fuck up. He too has another subplot that doesn't end where he is thinking about breaking up with his boyfriend. Oh, that's right, he has a boyfriend. And that what I just did there is how you introduce a person's sexuality, by not throwing it in there along with your name and age. Why is it needed to point out what their sexual orientation is about? And this is a reoccurring thing throughout the comic. Questrek keeps writing stories about the random people you see in the background. They are all introduced with name, race and their sexuality. Why mention that? Seriously, stuff like that pisses me off. It's the same as saying a black man. No, it's just a man. If you need to describe the person to people looking for him, then you can mention his skin color, seeing that make him easier to locate. <sighs> but I digress. And we return to the worst for last. Bruce. Fuck this guy. He's supposed to be the comic relief guy who should represent the everyday nerd, but he's just obnoxious and annoying. He's inconsiderate of other people, he's lazy, he's shallow, he's not funny, and he contributes nothing besides those abrupt jokes I mentioned before. Seriously, we're supposed to like this guy, but he's as close to a villain as they come in this comic. The only thing that keep me from punching this guy in the face would be the fear of his stupidity being contagious. This comic is bad. Really bad. It's really nice to see a furry comic that focuses on stuff other than spank material, but this does not save it from being horribly written, but with some otherwise good art. The premise is a 4. The idea is there, but Quidstrake needs some serious lessons in story writing if he at any point wishes for this to go anywhere. There are a lot of awful mistakes that you'd only see hardcore amateurs do. The art is a 6. The art is alright in an otherwise sloppy comic. Quidstrake dares doing some bold moves, which is commendable, but I feel he can make the art so much better. The characters are free. While there's no doubt Quidstrake is enthusiastic with this comic and its characters, there's no saving a horrible managed main cast. Sometimes, the randomly generated characters you only see in the background will be more interesting to see than the ones we follow. All in all, this comic is a 4. It is bad, boring, sloppy and, harsh as it may sound, amateur work. The art is okay, but not even that can save this shit. Guess I'll go prepare for the furry community to hurl their hate mail at me again. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next work on relief. Take. Hello there, buttercup. <laughs>